go for it. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to the August uh, GDJC talk. Uh, today, I would like to introduce to you uh, Daniela Nickel from the uh, German Institute of Human Nutrition, uh, Boston. She is a PhD student looking at the psychosocial determinants of uh, healthy food uh, diversity among spouses and siblings. And well, Daniela, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm very curious <laughs> about the interesting discussions in the end. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, and afternoon from my side again. So it's a great pleasure to present my current master's project here, which is focused on healthy food diversity and the risk of major chronic diseases within the Epic Potsdam cohort. And uh, first of all, um, Thank you for this opportunity to give you some insights here into our work at the Department of Molecular Epidemiology. But without uh, further ado, let us start diving into the concept of diet diversity. So some decades ago, long before I started studying nutrition science, I found pleasure and happiness in eating colorful and diverse dishes. Being then a student, I realized that food diversity Sorry, I just need uh, the pointer, I think. So I realized that food diversity um, can not only look like that, being, so to say, health oriented, but it can also look like that, being probably similarly diverse, but in a much unhealthier way. And this is when my interest in dietary pattern research aroused and the concept of healthy food diversity caught my attention. So I became interested in how diverse people eat and how their diets, dif uh, diets diversity relate to the health or disease. What I came up with was not as satisfying as hoped. So on the one hand, um, diet diversity has been internationally recommended for decades. So, for, so in Germany, for example, um, the first recommendation is focused on enjoying food diversity to ensure a balanced diet. So it must be clearly beneficial, I thought. However, on the other hand, recently published reviews have identified limited evidence supporting a beneficial association between diet diversity and health outcomes. So why is that? It actually brings us back to my discovery while being a student. So diet diversity can be very diverse when it comes to diet quality, so that the concept of diet diversity does not necessarily distinguish between healthy and unhealthy foods. So the limiting evidence um, identified in, re in recent reviews is potentially due to this concept of uh, diet quality versus diet diversity, and it's due to large methodological differences between the studies. So there have been many different definitions of diet diversity so far introduced in the literature, and there's still a lack of consensus about how to measure and conceptualize diet diversity. So for example, there are indicators based on um, assessing diet diversity, either based on food items or based on food groups. And these are simple count measures of either different food items or different food groups adding up um, to yield um, a diet a measure of diet diversity. And of course, um, these indicators cannot can neither uh, reflect the quality of the diet nor the proportionality, the proportional distribution of foods and food groups. So a highly diverse diet can either consist of diversity in healthy or unhealthy foods. However, um, diet quality and proportionality are very important when it comes to energy intake and when it comes to health in an obesogenic food environment. So, uh, therefore, previous researchers developed other indicators, for example, those which are based on dietary guidelines. And one example is the Healthy Food Diversity Index, which is based on the German dietary guidelines in this case. And this index is a multidimensional index and considers the concept of diet diversity defined as the number of foods eaten. It considers diet quality defined as the concordance with German dietary guidelines, and it considers the proportionality, which um, is defined as the distribution or balance of food groups in the diet. Up to now, 
as far as we know, only a few studies have investigated the Healthy Food Diversity Index, and especially with regard to adiposity indicators, with regard to body weight chain or metabolic syndrome. So for example, in some US studies, um, a beneficial association was identified and also um, in some uh, studies from China, a beneficial association was identified be between the Healthy Food Diversity Index and adiposity markers on metabolic syndrome. However, um, to our knowledge, the Healthy Food Diversity Index have not been applied in relation to major chronic diseases. But as we are all aware of, major chronic diseases account for the majority of deaths worldwide and in Germany, um, and, it, and they have uh, multiple risk factors comprising modifiable uh, behaviors and many others. Um, and a poor diet, so unhealthy diets, are a key modifiable risk factor for chronic diseases. So bringing it all together, um, in this study, we aimed to first describe healthy food diversity among Epic Potsdam study participants at baseline. And second, we wanted to investigate the effect of the German Healthy Food Diversity Index on the risk of major chronic diseases. So namely type two diabetes, myocardial infarction and stroke during the follow-up of the Epic Potsdam cohort. The data which was used for this study stemmed from the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition Study, which is a multi-center prospective cohort study in, and it was initiated in 1992 to investigate the association between diet and risk of chronic diseases and mortality in 10 European countries. So one study center is located in Potsdam and um, there in Potsdam, there was um, a random sample of the general population recruited via addresses supplied by the registration offices. And in Potsdam, recruitment started um, in 1994, resulting in 27,548 participants. And from then onwards, participants were re-invited for follow-up in approximately two years intervals. So um, in this study, data until the end of follow-up five uh, were used, um, comprising more than 25,000 participants. Yep. The baseline, uh, yeah, the data collection, I will just um, introduce you on this slide. So um, baseline data um, comprised food intake and lifestyle factors and medical history, which were collected via either questionnaires or interviews. And um, at the physical examination or a physical examination at the study center enabled also assessments of anthropometric information, for example. The follow-up assessments included questionnaires to collect information on incident diseases, but also on changes of lifestyle factors. All right, so to create our exposure of interest, the Healthy Food Diversity Index, we used the dietary data which was assessed at baseline using a validated, self-administered and semi-quantitative uh, food frequency questionnaire. And this FFQ, FFQ comprised 148 single food items and reflected the consumption during the past year. And the individual's usual food intake in grams per day was then used for subsequent construction of the Healthy Food Diversity Index. But before presenting a formula or the calculation of the index, I think we need some background of the basis of the index. So um, the healthiness of the diet um, was created uh, was was yeah was created via um, by using a health factor. So um, or actually the healthiness was described via creation of a health factor. And this health factor was developed as the following. So the German nutrition cycle was used to create um, the recommended proportions of the main food groups, which are plant foods, animal foods, and fats and oils. And the recommended proportions of the food subgroups, which you can see in the table, so there are 15 food subgroups and the recommended proportion of these food subgroups were based on the qualitative dimension of the German food pyramid, which was quantified by the group around Dreschert Al in Germany. And the proportion of the food subgroup 
were then multiplied by the proportion of the main food group to yield the health factor. So there is um, there was one health factor generated per subgroup. And based on the proposed definition by um, Drescher et al, the food items we uh, had in our, in our dietary data set um, were comprised into those three main food groups and the 15 food subgroups, which you've just seen in the table. And the health factors were then multiplied by the share of each individual food item by weight and then summed up to yield the individual health value, which actually um, describes the healthiness of the diet. And this health value was then multiplied by the Berry Index, which quantifies the number and the proportion of foods eaten. And this altogether gave us the Healthy Food Diversity Index per person with the range between zero and nearly one. And for further analysis, we um, divided the, this index into three groups, approximately equal in size, which I will be further referring to as turtles, or lower, moderate, and higher healthy food diversity index. Our outcome of interest were incident type 2 diabetes, incident myocardial infarction, and incident stroke, which were obtained from self-reports during follow-up but also um, they were verified by physicians and we only used the verified cases. So we we'll just quickly guide you through our statistical approach. Of course, we did some data preparation steps, um, described the study population with regard to baseline characteristics and also check correlations between the healthy food diversity index and the nutrient intake. And the main analysis, the longitudinal association between the healthy food diversity index and the risk of major chronic diseases was then investigated by Cox proportional hazards regression models, which I will now um, dive deeper into on this slide and the next ones. Um, so the uh, uh, dependent variable were the incidence of type 2 diabetes and myostroke in separate models. And the independent variable was the healthy food diversity index, either used continuously per one standard deviation or per one unit of the score, or um, we included the independent variable as the categorical variable using the turtles. And the dependent time variable in these models were the time period between age of recruitment and age of exit. To um, yeah, assess uh, potential confounders and covariates that need to be adjusted for in the regression models. We checked the literature prior to analysis and um, created those uh, directed acyclic graphs um, separately for each outcome. So here you can see our idea of um, a DAC with regard to type 2 diabetes. So um, presenting the potential causal effect from um, off healthy food diversity index and type 2 diabetes, and including those potential confounders, covariates, risk factors in there, um, which we thought um, are um, yeah, most important. Um, and based on these DAGs, we created um, our ideas how to um, run the analysis. So first of all, um, we thought gender would ra rather be um, an effect measure modifier, so therefore we stratified the analysis. Um, in the first model, we um, used um, age stratification as um, um, yeah, a str strategy to adjust for age. And the second model includes the confounders education, occupation, smoking status, alcohol intake, total en energy intake and physical activity. And in the third model, we also included prevalent hypertension, vitamin supplementation, and waist circumference. I show you the, the DAG for MI as well and the models. Um, however, I know that like we focused on diabetes here, but um, yeah, to be uh, uh, to, to fully present um, our project, I will also show all the results for the other um, endpoints. So we um, run gender strat stratified analysis for MI and stroke as well. We edge stratified the models and additionally adjusted for lifestyle factors and socioeconomic status and energy intake in the second model. And in the third model in here, um, it is slightly different from the diabetes models. So we also adjusted for prevalent hypertension, but also prevalent type two diabetes, hyperlipidemia, 
and waist circumference. Okay, for stroke, the models are the same. The deck looks yeah, similar. So we'll not show it here. So let me just briefly present the analytical sample size. We had to exclude some participants with missing follow-up time and also with implausible energy intake. We further had to exclude some participants which had missing dietary data and those with uh, missing values in covariates, but we still ended up with a large sample size of 20, 26,591. However, we subsequently had to make more exclusions um, based on the outcome of interest. So for example, we excluded prevalent and not yet verified cases or cases with unknown date of occurrence. And at the bottom, you see the outcome specific. Uh, sample size, which is for diabetes, it's 20, um, 25,000 bit more. The calculated healthy food diversity index was um, normally distributed, as you can see uh, here, but slightly higher in uh, women than in men. I just realized that uh, women are presented in blue, I'm sorry, <laughs> but um, we do see the difference. And um, yeah, with regard to energy adjusted um, sperm and correlation coefficients between the healthy food diversity index and specified uh, nutrients, the index performed moderately with, for example, total folate um, for, uh, with vitamin E, and it uh, performed moderately with, uh, inversely moderately with saturated fatty acids, but it was quite strongly correlated with vitamin C, and smaller correlations were found for other. Um, nutrients. Yeah, we do see that um, the mean healthy food diversity index in this population was moderate healthy food diversity when we remember the range between zero and one. With regard to population characteristics, it was interesting that women were more likely to have higher healthy food diversity than men. And the population was around 50 years old at recruitment, which did not differ um, according to the adherence to the Healthy Food Diversity Index. However, the majority of the population was overweight or obese with a slight uh, decrease from lower to higher Healthy Food Diversity Index. There were less current or former smokers with better Healthy Food Diversity. And surprisingly, educational level of the population did not differ much across the turtles of the Healthy Food Diversity Index. And occupation status was slightly different with around 5% less full-time workers in the group with higher Healthy Food Diversity. All right, so now I present the main association results driven from the Cox proportional hazards regression. So as I said, we run gender stratified analysis. Um, here in the plot, you see at the top, um, in the top, the, the results for men and on the bottom, the results for women. I present the association uh, associations across the three groups of uh, the Healthy Food Diversity Index, which you see here in this plot. So um, we, we have the legend here. So um, in red, I present the lower Healthy Food Diversity Index. Um, in, in yellow, we see the, the second turtle, um, the moderate Healthy Food Diversity Index, and in green, higher Healthy Food Diversity Index. And the reference is always the lower Healthy Food Diversity Index. And I also present the results continuously per one standard deviation of the index. So with regards to men, healthy food diversity was not associated with uh, type two diabetes in this cohort. However, um, surprisingly, there seemed to be a linear trend um, towards a higher risk of type two diabetes um, in those with higher healthy food diversity. But uh, of course, I mean, we do see that this is not uh, statistically significant. However, we could argue whether there is a trend. Um, and in women, this trend was not detectable. We could rather discuss about a small um, beneficial association, but still very small and not statistical significant. When we investigated myocardial infarction, no associations were observed, neither for men nor for women, as you can see here. However, regarding the third outcome stroke, 
healthy food diversity was inversely associated um, with stroke in men yielding, for example, a hazard ratio of 0.65 in the third adjustment model um, and the third tertile. And um, yeah, it, as we see here in the multiple adjusted, uh, adjusted model, the effect became slightly stronger and um, it was still uh, detectable in the continuous analysis. Instead, in women, the association seemed to be the other way around. So women with higher adherence to healthy food diversity tended to be of higher risk of stroke, which became even significant in uh, yeah, the continuous analysis when we look at the 95% confidence intervals. Okay. So to sum up uh, the results at this state of analysis, we have uh, quantified healthy food diversity in this middle-aged German population from Potsdam and surrounding areas. And the mean population had moderate healthy food diversity with women having higher healthy food diversity compared to men. And we further identified um, no significant associations between healthy food diversity and type 2 diabetes in both men and women, but we could discuss about having identified small trends which were rather harmful in men and beneficial in women, rather beneficial in women. With regard to MI and stroke, strong associations were only found for stroke and higher healthy food diversity seemed to be beneficial when it came to the incidence of stroke in um, men while in women with higher healthy food diversity um, or higher healthy food diversity in women seem to have a higher risk of stroke. Before I come to um, a conclusion now, I wanted to um, talk about strengths and limitations of the study because of course, um, there are always strengths and limitations. And also when we look at the results, which were expected slightly uh, well different, I would say, um, we especially think about probably um, probable uh, limitations in this study. Um, so let me just go through it with you together. Um, there, um, we had a large follow-up study for sure um, and a high validity of incident uh, cases due to, very, due to um, the verification process. But um, unfortunately um, we did have quite a small number of incident MI and stroke cases, which would of course limit um, the power of our analysis. The dietary pattern approach is definitely a strength um, to reflect the complexity, complexity of the diet and to, to look at like the overall um, or the diet overall. And of course, um, with regard to diet diversity, it's a strength that we used a multidimensional measure um, and based on, it was based on dietary guidelines. However, the dietary assessment um, was uh, yeah, via food frequency questionnaire, which um, always uh, comes together with, um, to some extent, some misreporting bias um, or social desirability bias, something like that, which would, of course, um, bias our estimates. And um, the Healthy Food Diversity Index indeed um, does have some limitations. So um, we could argue whether it's probably, um, we could probably modify this index and adapt it to current evidence, something like that. Um, however, so far there is no better index out there to our knowledge. And um, also this index wasn't used um, before that much, um, especially not with regard to chronic diseases. So um, it was just, um, yeah, very important to, to look into this index and its associations at some point. Um, we thought about a social desirability bias with regard to women, because we were wondering about the results um, in, in uh, women between uh, the association results between um, health food diversity index and stroke in women, which was actually a harmful association. So we were wondering about that and thought um, this could be due to a social desirability bias because women um, tend to misreport their dietary behavior. So they tend to um, overestimate, for example, their fruit and vegetable intake, which would lead to a higher, a much higher healthy food diversity index um, as in, it would be in, in reality. 
Okay. And um, coming to the next point, we did exclude prevalent cases and cases with unknown date of occurrence, but still um, we are um, we, we only assessed uh, diet and covariance at baseline so that there could be some uh, time dependent changes of lifestyle behavior, which could, um, could lead to reverse causality. However, we, we will perform sensitivity analysis. So we thought about um, excluding those cases in the first two years of follow-up. But if you have any other ideas, I'm very happy to discuss about that. We did adjust for many potential uh, confounders, we think, um, and thought about that for a very long time, uh, creating the DAX and so on. But still, there um, could be some residual and unknown confounding in the analysis. So what do we conclude from this project so far? This brings me back um, to my early discover discovery of diverse diets being potentially different in diet quality. We still think this is true and we do have to keep that in mind when investigating the diet's diversity. However, in this study using the German Healthy Food Diversity Index, its ability to affect major chronic diseases is not as clear as expected. So we still need to fully interpret, interpret and discuss the results. And moreover, um, we assume that um, especially when it comes to the index, a modification could be um, very appropriate to yield better performance of the index with regard to chronic diseases. Um, so we thought, for example, that um, there is better or more recent evidence out there on food groups demonstrating clear associations with risk of chronic diseases, which has not been um, not been in, in the index calculation. So for example, um, fermented versus non-fermented dairy um, could be distinguished for, um, which was not in, in the index as, as it was. We could also distinguish between processed meat, red meat and white meat. And I think we could separate some food groups in more detail. For example, we could uh, separate fish and eggs from meat products, which was not done um, according to the definition by Drescher et al. So we don't know, maybe um, we are able to modify this index or do we actually have to use a complete different diet diversity index comprising diet quality. However, um, I'm not sure whether there's anything out there. Um, I couldn't find anything um, by using, um, by um, doing a systematic literature review, but probably at some point there will be. And I think um, with this, I'm, also, um, I'm already at the end uh, of my presentation. So um, I would uh, like to thank um, my two supervisors of this project and also of my PhD, um, who are Matthias Schulze and Franziska Janas from our department. I want to thank um, the working group and I thank you for your attention and of course for the opportunity to be here. I'm very happy to take questions and comments and discuss with you together about the project. Thank you. Thank you very much.